And all of this came together with a bunch of people in uh, our labs that I've been working in, and there's too many to name. I promise I list all of you in my dissertation. Uh, and then I want to thank the funding, specifically Florida Sea Grant, uh, for providing a majority of this research and the, the infrastructure to do this research. And also uh, some grants through NSF, uh, specifically the Florida Coastal Everglades LTER. And the FIU Dissertation Year Fellowship has really helped me out a lot this past year. Uh, but before I get started, I just really want to thank these four people. So Sean, Evie, Nick, and Shelby, we all came in at the same time. And really, without them, it's, I wouldn't have gotten through this. So Sean, he's always making these crazy faces. Evie was never really a help in the field. She provided, she provided great comments on writing, so I'll give her that. Nick, he's studying algae in Antarctica now, and Shelby's always provides great entertainment. At the so, yeah. I wanted to thank you guys because without you guys, I wouldn't have gotten here. So thanks. All right. So my work was done in coastal wetlands, and so why do we why do we think of coastal wetlands as being important? Well, they provide many valuable ecosystem services. Uh, so they are. Uh, very important for fisheries. Uh, they provide storm protections for hurricanes. Um, and they provide a lot of recreation and ecotourism. So they have a very great economic impact on the areas in which they're located. But the one ecosystem service I'm really going to talk today about is carbon storage. So coastal marshes are really efficient at storing carbon. So they suck up carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They used this to uh, build biomass, uh, leaves and roots. And then this is a majority made of carbon. It gets stored, goes into the soil. And because these ecosystems remain wet for a majority of the time, decomposition is really slow. So this carbon stays in the soil. And just to put it in perspective, uh, mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrasses, these uh, so-called blue carbon ecosystems, can store just orders of magnitude more carbon than a terrestrial forest. But, but, there's this big but, because climate change is happening and sea level rise is accelerating. So these ecosystems, they've been along the coast, they've adapted to these you know, slower rates of sea level rise. But as, um, as sea level rise rates accelerate, it's uncertain if these marshes will be able to keep up with this pace, with this pace of sea level rise and putting this storage of carbon in doubt. So the coastal wetlands I'm going to talk about today are the Florida Everglades. I think it's important to understand the, the history of how water has been uh, managed or mismanaged through the ecosystem. So in the past, there was lots of water flowing from the north to the southern coastal Everglades. But now, because canals and levees have been built, water has been shunted away, and there's a lot less water coming in to the southern parts. So when you get less water coming south and accelerated rates of sea level rise, you're starting to, you're going to get, get uh, large rates of saltwater intrusion coming into these areas. Uh, so here's a map showing uh, just South Florida in 1995 and what it might look like with just a two foot rise in sea level. Um, so it's really low in elevation and highly susceptible to sea level rise. So my main question was, what does this mean for carbon storage, and specifically in the Everglades? So to, before we get there, I want you to understand the, the type of carbon that's in the soils of the Everglades. So uh, a lot of the Everglades are made up of these peat marshes. So peat is very um, organic rich, uh, high in carbon. And the way it's created is, like I said before, plants suck up CO2 out of the atmosphere and a lot of it goes into roots. And because decomposition is slow, uh, these marshes are able to actually build elevation. This is how they keep up with sea level rise. And in a lot of the coastal peat marshes of the Everglades, they're not tidal. So in other marshes, uh, specifically tidal ones, they get um, sedimentation coming from other areas. And this helps them build elevation. But in a lot of the coastal peat marshes, they don't get this. So really, it's the balance between productivity and decomposition that determines what happens to peak. 
So when the peat marshes are healthy, if you look at it from an aerial view, you might see this uniform uh, marsh. You know, the, the Everglades is the river of grass. Uh, so you get this nice uniform area. But what we've been seeing in some of the brackish areas of the Everglades is instead of a uniform marsh, you start to see a lot of these little little pockets, which are areas of open water. And one hypothesis that we have is that these pockets are formed by saltwater intrusion. So how could that happen? Well, they have this nice diagram that shows uh, uh, current conditions. So this is a freshwater sawgrass marsh up here. This is brackish water. It's down more towards the coast. But as you start to get saltwater intrusion, that brackish water comes into these freshwater areas. It can cause uh, sawgrass to become stressed. Uh, there's different biogeochemical processes going on in the soil. And it can uh, cause these marshes to potentially collapse. And then if you look from it above, you get these pools forming. So if you actually go down to the marsh level, you can see these pretty uh, dramatic images. So this is a, a group of sawgrass combs here. And if you zoom into this area, what you can see is this is the bottom of the combs, and these are all exposed roots. So, you know, we don't, sawgrass plants, they don't grow like this. You know, their roots are usually in the soil. So what this tells us is the soil surface used to be up here, and now it's all the way down here. This is about 40 centimeters lower than what it used to be. So we're seeing this peat soils collapsing around the sawgrass that's already out there. So we don't actually know the drivers and mechanisms that's causing this to happen. But I do have some hypotheses. Um, so what are some potential drivers? The first we think the main one is salt water, because these are areas where saltwater intrusion is currently happening. So, how could saltwater cause peat collapse? Um, so, if you've been coming to all my talks, you've probably seen this really not so great conceptual figure. It looks pretty uh, crappy. I've been told uh, this, this uh, roots and soils kind of looks like a cockroach. Uh, my <laughs> microbes look like birds. But, so, it's my defense presentation, so I thought I'd upgrade it a little bit. So, doesn't that look much nicer? <laughs> All right, so this is how I'm going to show a lot of my hypotheses and then my conclusions for my chapters is using this conceptual figure. So this represents a, a typical marsh, uh, an Everglades sawgrass marsh. So you have different components of the marsh. You have the sawgrass, you have uh, periphyte, so this is the, the algal component, and you also have microbes in the soil. So what typically happens, there's uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, Plants take it up through photosynthesis. Algae can do that as well. Um, they also respire a little bit back. And then the microbes, they can uh, decompose the soil. They're mainly respiring CO2 back. But if you look at the arrows, and the magnitude of the arrows are important, there's more carbon going into the marsh than going out. So they're able to build elevation. However, under future conditions, where these little salt shakers are going to represent salt water intrusion, the salt coming in. You can see that the plants, they might become more stressed, so they're taking up less CO2, respiring more out. Um, the algae can be, has been shown to break up. And there's actually some mix in the literature about what happens to uh, soil respiration. So some have been shown that it increases soil respiration. Other studies have shown that it decreases it. And others have shown that nothing happens. So here, I'm not going to focus too much on the, the microbial component, but my, my hypothesis was that soil respiration wouldn't really change, but you might get a change in the community. But I didn't really look at that, that was just a, a thought I had. But if you look at the arrows, there's now less going in, there's more going out, so that could cause the peak to collapse if you get the exposed breeze. So there's a few terms I want to bring up before I go into my data. So the first is net ecosystem productivity. So this is the overall gas exchange balance in the marsh. So this tells you the total amount of CO2 going into and out of the marsh. And if you break that down into the separate components, there's gross ecosystem productivity. So this represents mainly photosynthesis. And then ecosystem respiration, so the outgoing component. So I'll be 
showing a lot of this data, so I want to get you familiar with it. Uh, another potential driver of peat collapse could be nutrients, and in the Everglades specifically, phosphorus. So saltwater intrusion, when you start to think about it in the Everglades, it's a little bit more complicated than just an elevated salinity. So most of the Everglades, except with these uh, areas near the agricultural areas that are more polluted, are generally very low in phosphorus concentrations. So small amounts of phosphorus can really stimulate productivity. So in these coastal areas, where does that phosphorus come from? It actually comes from the ocean. So it comes from salt water. So as salt water comes in, you can get uh, phosphorus coming in from the overlying water. But in the Everglades, you also get a lot of um, groundwater upwelling occurring. So this is where uh, brackish water underneath the ground actually comes straight up uh, to the marsh. And the bedrock <coughs> of the Everglades is made of limestone. And this limestone has a lot of uh, phosphorus absorbed to it. But when salt water comes in, it has a lot of different constituents and ions that actually cause this phosphorus to be desorbed. And once this phosphorus comes off of the limestone, it's actually made available to vegetation. So when you think of saltwater intrusion in the Everglades, especially in the freshwater areas, um, it can actually provide both a subsidy in the form of phosphorus <laughs> as well as a stress in salinity. So um, you'll see I try to tease apart these, these two factors later on. And then the third potential driver that we think might be causing peak collapse is hydrology, which is both inundation and drought. So why do we think of inundation? Well, when if we think of sea level rise, if we go back to this map, we see that there's a lot more areas underwater. So how does this influence carbon cycling? Well, mainly it has an effect on the soil respiration and the microbes. So in this schematic, you see all the oxygen in the air, and when water is covering the soil surface, it diffuses a lot slower into the water. And microbes, they really love oxygen for um, their metabolism. So when they don't have as much, there's less respiration, there's less CO2 leaving the soil. However, when water falls below the soil surface, they have greater accessibility to oxygen, so soil respiration is much higher. So if you think about sea level rise coming in, it could lead to actually more greater inundating conditions, which could potentially offset some of the, the less, uh, the, the stress that comes to some of the plants. Okay. So how do we measure changes in carbon cycling with saltwater intrusion? Well, we set up a really big experiment, but um, specifically what, we, what I did is I used a static chamber technique. So I, took, I created this, this clear box, and you can go and you put it over a portion of the marsh, and it looks like this when it's closed. So basically what you can do is you, you pump air from the chamber into a little instrument here that measures the concentration of carbon dioxide. And when you're measuring it in the light, the plants inside the box, they're sucking up CO2, so the concentration actually decreases over time. So you can measure the rate of photosynthesis. And then when you put this in the dark, you cut photosynthesis off. So you're only <coughs> measuring respiration. So using these, you can get, um, you can measure the overall CO2 exchange going into and out of the marsh. Okay, so the way I tested how carbon cycling changes with saltwater intrusion, so I used a couple different types of experiments. And I looked at it along this freshwater to marine uh, gradient. So the first experiment I'm going to talk to you about in chapter one is these field manipulations that we did. So we looked at saltwater intrusion in both freshwater and brackish water marshes. Um, in chapter two, we look at saltwater intrusion just in a freshwater marsh in a mesocosm type experiment. And I'll explain these once I get there. <clears throat> and in chapter three, we looked at saltwater intrusion in an inundation in a brackish marsh. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, the first set of these experiments was done by uh, Lisa Chambers uh, back in 2011. Yeah. So uh, she looked at saltwater intrusion and inundation effects in coastal mangroves. So I started to move more towards the freshwater end to see how that would be. Okay, so chapter one, we're looking at in situ salinity pulses. So in situ means in place. So these, uh, we actually went out 
to these areas within the Everglades and added saltwater directly to the marsh. So this is a, what our setup looks like at our freshwater site, just to give you an idea. So when we're out there, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I'm mainly just going to show you carbon cycling and plant productivity, but there are lots of other measurements going on looking at uh, changes in water, biogeochemistry, algae, microbes, all that stuff. So we had a big crew going on out there. So our research site, so our freshwater site is up here near the Paiyoki Outlook, if you're familiar with the Everglades, and the Brackish Water Marsh is down near Westlake. So how do we add saltwater to the marsh? So we went out there, we, uh, we made up a solution of um, saltwater brine where we, we knew the, the salinity concentration of the surface water, so we, we adjusted our, our dose based on that. And we had a hose, and then we just go out there and we add, add it to this enclosed area. So we had these circular chambers that we are able to open and close to, uh, to make sure we are only adding salt to a specific portion. All right, so now let's get into some data. So first, I want to show you the, the salinity from each site. So up here, we're going to have the freshwater site and the brackish water site. Um, in the closed symbols, is going to be our ambient pour water, and then open symbols is where we add the salt. I just wanted to show you that at the freshwater site, we were able to elevate salinity. So this is two years that we were going out there and adding salt. So for two years, on average, we are able to raise salinity about 2.6 parts per thousand above ambient. Um, and this was measured 24 hours after we added salinity. And at the brackish water site, we were able to raise it about 5 parts per thousand. So these aren't really dramatic changes. They're just slight changes. Um, but still, they represent elevating conditions. If we look at how the sawgrass responded to the salt, up here I have coal density plotted. And on the bottom, I have above ground biomass. The symbols are the same. So at the freshwater site, down here, you see that there was no difference at all in either cold density or above ground biomass in the sawgrass. But at the brackish water site, what you see is during the first year, year and a half, there were basically no changes when we added salt. But towards the end of the two years, we started to see the separation where it appeared that salt water was um, kind of stifling uh, new calm growth and above ground biomass. So it seemed like continual stress was starting to have an effect on sawgrass. Now if we look at net ecosystem productivity, um, so for this data I have uh, NEP plotted against water level. But you'll see hydrology is really important at determining whether the marsh is a carbon sink, which is going to be a positive value for this presentation, or a carbon source to the atmosphere, which is a negative value. So at our freshwater site, so in the black is our, our controls, and then right next to it is the gray, and is a, our salt dose treatment. So if you just look, you, start, you see this pattern with water level where when water covers the soil surface, it's a, a net carbon sink, and when water falls below the soil surface, a carbon source. So this makes sense. It goes back to that inundation conceptual figure I showed you where if microbes have greater accessibility to oxygen, they're going to respire more. So this wasn't a surprise. And really, except for a, a few months here where adding salt had a significant effect, if we looked at it overall when it was both wet and dry, uh, adding salt didn't have much of an effect on NEP in the fresh water. So when we look at the brackish water site, when we look at water level, we see that the same pattern where when water, water, water level falls below the soil surface, it becomes a net carbon source and a net sink when it's above. But interestingly, every time it fell below the soil surface and we added salt, that caused more CO2 to be released to the atmosphere. And this only happened when it was dry, not when it was wet. Um, so this is really interesting. And if we look into some of the, the components, so we look at GEP and ER, we can see what was really causing this. So over here, I have both the, the averages plotted when it was wet 
and then when it was dry. So when it was wet, you remember there was no significant difference, and this just confirms that. But when it was dry, we saw there's a significant carbon source. And this was a combination of a, a slight reduction in GEP, so uh, less photosynthesis going on, and a slight increase in ecosystem respiration. So although the, neither of these were significant, when you, you know, combine them together, you get a significant carbon source. So this was just instantaneous flux. So when I modeled it to actually an annual time frame, um, what you can see here, and really I just want you to show, focus on net ecosystem production. So this is the freshwater site and the brackish water site. At the freshwater site, we saw that uh, with um, under ambient and added salt concentrations, it was about carbon neutral. And this actually lines up pretty well with some of uh, Sparkle Malone and Greg Starr's work at a nearby Eddy Flux Tower that showed that this Shark River Slough long hydroperiod marsh is basically about carbon neutral. It depends on the year and the hydrology, La Nina, El Nino, but you can talk to Sparkle about that. Uh, but interestingly and really surprising, the brackish water marsh over the two years we were out there, it was a net carbon source to the atmosphere. And adding salt didn't really have much of an effect overall. Um, so we saw that, you know, instead of being a carbon sink, which we think of most coastal marshes are, it was a net carbon source. <coughs> and if you remember back to the what I was telling you about peat in the Everglades, it's really all about the roots. So after two years of adding salt, we went out and took these cores so we can measure the amount of live roots in the soil. And what I saw here was if we look at the brackish water site, and I looked at these at three different depths, and then you can compare the overall to the, the ambient water and the salt, so this is the control. And when we added salt, we saw this significant reduction in overall live roots found in the soil. And we even found this in the freshwater site. So if you remember, there wasn't any effect on above ground productivity or above ground, you know, net ecosystem production, so CO2 uptake. But when we looked below ground, adding salt was really having this significant effect on the roots. So, in conclusion, uh, at our freshwater site, so here we have freshwater and then we add salt, so each of these salt shakers is going to represent about five parts per thousand for this uh, presentation. So we saw no change in above ground carbon cycling, but we saw this reduction in live roots. The brackish site, um, even under ambient conditions, we saw it was a net source of CO2 to the atmosphere. So it was releasing more CO2. And then we saw two different responses depending on hydrology. When it was wet, there was no difference compared to the controls. But when it dried down, we saw it was a greater CO2 source. And there was also a reduction in live roots. Okay, so what's next? Well, we saw that the freshwater sawgrass productivity was pretty resilient to pulses of low level salinity. So above ground, but not below ground. So what happens if we continually increase salinity exposure? So remember, we only raised it about two to three parts per thousand above ambient conditions. So the next step was to try and take this freshwater marsh and give it the same conditions that we see at our brackish water site. So for chapter two, and for the rest of the experiments I'm going to talk about, uh, they're all mesocosm-based experiments. So I wanted to show you our, our setup down in Key Largo, which was uh, really great to work in. So why do we do mesocosm experiments? Well, in the field, uh, when we're out there adding salt water, um, it's, it's allowed to you know, be flushed away because it's, it's open to the rest of the ecosystem. So under mesocosm conditions, we can uh, specifically target our experimental units, so salinity concentration, and keep it elevated and really see what happens when we um, expose these marshes to higher salinity conditions. So for chapter two, we're looking at a freshwater marsh and we're looking at saltwater intrusion and P addition. So I just wanted to reorient you, why are we looking at P? So remember, we think when salt water first comes into these freshwater marshes, it's also going to expose it to more phosphorus, the subsidy. So we wanted to see this uh, subsidy stress response relationship. 
So for this experiment, uh, we collected these uh, sawgrass peat monoliths from uh, this area up near Crum Avenue and transported down to Key Largo, our mesocosm facilities. So the great thing about this one is Florida DOT, they were planning on widening Crum Avenue anyway, so we were out able to go out there and take whatever we wanted. So we went big. And so we got these really, really big monoliths. And oh man, that was an adventure <laughs> getting these, these cores. Um, but I think it was worth it because anytime you get to see your advisor this dirty, it's, uh, it's pretty worth it. So for this experiment, we took uh, 24 of these monoliths out and we had uh, four different treatments where we manipulated salinity and phosphorus. So our salinity treatments, ambient was freshwater, and elevated was over the two years that we did this experiment, the average salinity was about nine parts per thousand. So this was about the same ambient conditions that are, were at our brackish water site in the first chapter. Um, so we were trying to mimic maybe future conditions of this marsh and then compare it to what we found in the brackish water. And then in half of these monoliths, we continually added phosphorus at about uh, 0.45 milligrams phosphorus per day. So this is about uh, twice the ambient amount of phosphorus they would usually get uh, in the field. All right, so now I'm gonna show you sawgrass production. For this experiment, um, the circles are gonna be the fresh triangles are added salt. And if it's an open circle, it also got phosphorus. So what you can see uh, during this first year, there's not really any patterns emerging, but during the, the second year that we did this experiment, that, that we continue to do this experiment, we start to see the separation between the ones where we added phosphorus and the ones where we didn't add phosphorus, to where there was a significant effect on sawgrass biomass when we added phosphorus, but there was no effect of salinity, which is pretty surprising. When we look at the carbon flux, so this is net ecosystem productivity. Uh, so this was overall, it was a, a net carbon sink. And you kind of see the same pattern emerge where when you add phosphorus, they get a greater net ecosystem production. But interestingly, towards the end of the two years, we start, at least when you look at the ones where we added phosphorus, so these are the salt ones, you start to get the separation. So maybe this is saying that after two years, even though the phosphorus subsidy is still much higher than the salt stress, the salt stress is finally starting to have an effect, potentially. And when we break this out into gross ecosystem productivity and ecosystem respiration, we see most of this is driven by photosynthesis, and it's really a, a reduction in photosynthesis that is causing this separation. So now I wanted to show you above ground versus below ground plant production. So you can imagine this zero line as a soil surface. So this is live above ground biomass at the end of the two year experiment where we saw phosphorus had a significantly increase above ground biomass and salt had no effect. But there was the opposite effect when we looked below ground where we saw phosphorus had no effect, but salinity had significantly reduced the amount of roots within the soil. So um, I also wanted to show you this ratio of above ground to below ground biomass. So uh, typically we saw under the control conditions, the plants were allocating a lot more of their biomass towards the below ground. But as we started to add salt and phosphorus, um, they started to allocate less towards the below ground and more towards the above ground. So this is likely because if there's more phosphorus within the soil, the plants don't need to produce more roots to take up this phosphorus. Um, but, so both the, the change in the ratio and the reduction with salt have kind of some pretty big implications because once again, I want to reiterate this, if peat soils are mostly roots, and you see a reduction of roots with elevated salinity, it could significantly affect peat soil stability. So, in conclusion, if we go back to our figure, um, when we add 
phosphorus versus the fresh water, we saw this really big <laughs> increase in biomass and more carbon coming into the marsh. When we added salt, if we compare it to our control, we saw no difference in um, above ground biomass or carbon exchange. And then when we add salt and phosphorus, which is a potential um, mechanism of saltwater intrusion into these freshwater marshes, we saw that the phosphorus subsidy that they could get was actually greater than the salt stress, but only when you were looking at above ground. So there's greater um, biomass, greater productivity, but when you look below ground, adding salt caused less roots within the soil. Okay, so what's next? Well, we saw they're still pretty resilient to higher levels of salinity, at least their productivity. So next step was to find what can actually affect, what salinity can actually affect the sawgrass. So our next experiment looked at elevated salinity and inundation as a second factor. And with this one, we looked at, at this, in this brackish water transition area. So just to remind you, uh, why are we looking at inundation? Um, salt water intrusion. Sea level rise could lead to greater inundation. So for these, we actually collected our monoliths from our brackish water field site. So we could directly compare what we were seeing in these mesocosms to what we were seeing in the field. So we took it back to Key Largo, and we set up this experiment where our treatments were um, ambient salinity was about 10 parts per thousand at the time we collected these, and we wanted to double that to 20. And then for our inundation treatment, we had we kept half of them completely submerged or entirely below water, and half of them were exposed where the top four centimeters were above water. And we did this experiment for 18 months. So first I want to show you soil CO2 flux. So this is what we would expect to be most affected by inundation. And in fact, that is what we saw. So for this experiment, the treatment labels are, the first part of it is what the salinity treatment was. So ambient salinity or elevated salt. And then the second part of the label is either submerged or exposed soils. So when we look at the exposed soils, we saw a much significantly higher um, respiration soil CO2 efflux going on. And when we had salt, we saw no effect. Um, so it seemed like uh, salinity wasn't really affecting the, the, at least the soil CO2 efflux. And when we look at plant productivity, so here are ambient treatments, so 10 parts per thousand, and our elevated salinity treatments. So we finally start to see this reduction with elevated salinity in the, the plant productivity, at least. And there was no real effect of inundation. And when we look at ecosystem carbon flux, so this is a net ecosystem productivity. Remember, a negative number is a carbon source. And we saw that under you know, ambient conditions, we saw that it was, it was uh, still a net carbon source. So this was what we saw in the field as well. So even under mesocosm conditions, we were getting the same result where there's more CO2 coming out of the marsh than going in. And then when we add salt, we get this, um, we, we see more CO2 coming out of the marsh. When we break this down again into gross ecosystem productivity and ecosystem respiration, this is mainly driven by a reduction in GE. These sawgrass plants were really becoming stressed. They were photosynthesizing a lot less. And ecosystem respiration, it slightly decreased, but the, it decreased less than the amount of GEP. So I really think it's um, plants that are driving this, this response towards more of a carbon source. So once again, coming back to our conclusions, um, under uh, ambient conditions, if we compare that to our exposed soils, we saw a greater uh, soil respiration. And when we elevated salinity, we finally started to see a reduction in productivity and below ground, right, above ground biomass. And when it was exposed, we saw that it was even a, a greater CO2 source because of this greater respiration.
Okay, so we finally found that somewhere between 10 and 20 parts per thousand, at least at continually elevated levels, that this level stress sawgrasses and it finally causes productivity to decline. And we also saw that the brackish marsh, this is the second experiment where we saw it's a definitive source of carbon to the atmosphere. Um, so it's not um, sequestering carbon. So now that we've looked at the potential mechanisms of peak collapse, let's try and actually measure it. So that was the point of chapter four. So for this experiment, I decided to look at elevated salinity and drought. So why drought? So if you remember back to chapter one, uh, we saw this interesting result in the brackish water site where when soil, the water level fell below the soil surface, uh, we saw adding salts significantly increase um, CO2 loss to the atmosphere. So I wanted to investigate further why, what was happening here, what was causing this, this to go on. So I wrote a proposal that was funded by NSF uh, to do one last mesocosm experiment to, to finally tease this apart. So why, why drought? Why is this dry down important? Well, if you remember back to the introduction, you know, we have a lot less uh, fresh water coming from north to the coastal Everglades. So really, this area down here where we're doing all these experiments, it really relies on precipitation for a lot of its water and for, you know, hydrology, so for water to cover the marsh. <coughs> it really needs precipitation. So if you get droughts, like this one we did in uh, 2015, when from that data that I showed you, we get this extreme drought, it's really going to affect water levels to the point where the marsh becomes unrecognizable. So this is our freshwater site where water is supposed to cover the soil surface for about 11 months out of the year. And we went out during this drought and it doesn't look like you're in a wetland anymore. It kind of looks like you're in a desert. So as you can imagine, this can really affect carbon cycling in the marsh. So for this experiment, we once again uh, took monoliths from the brackish water site and did it at our Key Largo mesocosm facilities. <coughs> we had the same treatments of salinity as our previous experiment, so ambient conditions about 10 and elevated is about 20. And for our inundation treatment, um, for our exposed ones, I wanted to mimic what actually happened at that brackish water site during the 2015. So this mimics water level at the site, so we can um, get a better sense of why or how carbon cycling is affected. And unlike a lot of the other chapters, I'm actually <coughs> going to try and show you a full <coughs> soil carbon balance of what's happening when this happens. So we take uh, lots of different types of measurements. I'm not going to go into them because we're quite low on time. Uh, but basically, we can start to fill in these boxes with some numbers. And instead of showing you all this data, which I'm sure you're happy not to have to see, I can just summarize it with this nice conceptual figure. So what I'm going to show you is the a net ecosystem carbon balance. So all of these uh, numbers are going to be in grams of carbon per meter squared. And if it's a rate, it's per year. Most of them are rates except the stocks. And I'm just going to show you two of the treatments. So this is ambient salinity and submerged. So this would be kind of ideal conditions that Water site and elevated salinity and drought, so kind of the, the more extreme conditions. So I'm going to start with uh, the input factors. So if we look at gross ecosystem productivity um, with elevated salinity and drought, it uh, decreased. And just to let you know, the color of these boxes are going to represent what had a significant effect on these, these rates. So for these, all these input factors were affected by salinity, but not drought. So there's less CO2 coming into the marsh. Uh, so you, there's also, that leads to less productivity in the plants. And less root productivity. So much, much less, uh, these plants are producing much less live roots. And that leads to uh, a lot less live roots within the soil. So if we look at turnover and decomposition that's happening within the soil and on the soil surface, um, what you can see is if you compare it to ambient conditions, um, 
decomposition actually slows down with elevated salinity. And drought doesn't really affect it. Even drought actually slowed down litter decomposition here. But even though elevated salinity is slowing down decomposition, it's only by about 20 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. But if you look at the reduction elevated salinity has on the inputs um, by reducing it by almost 300, it's really decomposition isn't, we, we don't think it's really controlling um, what's going on within the soil to cause peak. And then when we look at uh, respiration, uh, as we would expect, soil respiration really increased with drought, and that led to much greater ecosystem respiration, mainly controlled by greater soil respiration. And then if we look at net ecosystem productivity, so the overall carbon gas exchange balance, uh, we once again, even under ambient conditions, saw it was a net CO2 source. And when you subject it to elevated salinity and drought, that really accelerates the amount of carbon loss of the So now the exciting part you've all been waiting for, peak collapse, elevation change. So in this experiment, we actually um, measured that. So here I'm going to have uh, elevation change in centimeters plotted against water level over the, the one year that we did this experiment. So. Here in the open symbols are going to be our, our drought treatment, and the closed symbols are going to be our uh, uh, inundated conditions. And elevated salinity didn't matter at all for this. So what you can see is uh, during the onset of drought, it really accelerates the elevation loss or peak collapse compared to ones that were kept completely inundated. And when we brought the water back up, it, they stayed, the elevation stayed down. What was most surprising is the amount of elevation that these monoliths, even under ambient conditions and completely submerged, how much elevation they lost. And they lost almost about three centimeters of elevation just within one year under these mesocosm conditions. And just to put that in perspective, the accretion rate for these, these types of marshes within the Everglades has been shown to be only about one to two millimeters per year. So if we're seeing changes of centimeters per year of elevation loss, then there's, you can expect pretty dramatic changes to happen within the ecosystem. So one thought I had was this, because this was pretty dramatic results, and um, these were done in mesocosms. So there's sometimes you get you know, different artifacts that happen when you take plants out of their natural conditions, bring them to these simulated conditions. Um, so we happen at the same time to be doing this salinity and phosphorus experiment that I showed you in chapter two. And uh, Sean Charles was actually measuring elevation change that was happening on these when we were adding salt water. So I want to show you what he found. <coughs> so here in the black bars is going to be our, from the, the salinity drought experiment, open symbols is going to be the, the salinity phosphorus experiment. We well, can see these, these open, circles, it's about, we simulated, we took our freshwater marsh and simulated about what we saw at the brackish water site, and after one year, we saw about the exact same amount of elevation change that we saw in the other experiment. And the controls in his experiment, in that experiment, did not really change elevation. So this is maybe evidence that this type of elevation loss is actually happening because in this other experiment, our controls didn't lose elevation at all. But we can't say that for sure, but we will be able to soon. So this is uh, earlier this week on Monday, actually. Luke and I were out at our brackish water site. We recently installed some sediment elevation tables. So this will be able to, at our brackish water site, where we're actually seeing the peak collapsing, we'll be able to see how much the elevation is uh, how much, if there is elevation loss, at what rate, and then be able to compare it to these mesocosm results that I found. So this is uh, the next step to confirm uh, the rate of peak collapse. So in conclusion for this, um, you know, we saw net CO2 source led to elevation loss. You get given elevated salinity and drought. Drought really, and this dry down really accelerated peak. So I just want to end by talking about, um, you know, we, we thought this was a pretty abnormal year 
we have this extreme drought going on in, in the Everglades National Park. And here's the, the water level during that drought. We saw you know, it drop to 25 centimeters below the soil surface and was dry for, besides this one rainstorm, for about six months out of the year. So this is what we based our drought experiment on. Um, but then I went and I started looking at some of the historical data from the site, and it really surprised me that here in red is our 2015 drought year. And if you go back all the way to 2000, so this is just water level, yearly water level, what you can see is there's some years where it really gets dry, where it falls to up to 50 centimeters below the soil surface and can, is, can stay dry for long periods of time. So when actually, when you plot the average and standard deviation of this over a typical, over this, these 17 years, what you can see is our, our drought treatment, so this is the soil surface, it actually really just mimics what happens during an average year at the, this brackish water site. Um, so if this is happening every year and we're seeing that these dry down periods really accelerate peak collapse, uh, that's not looking great for these marshes. And one last piece of data I want to show you is um, the effect that these dry downs have on pore water salinity, so salinity within the soil. So here in these black symbols, I have the pore water salinity of our ambient plots. So we did not add salt water to these at all. And then in the open cir circles is the, the surface water salinity during that time. And I ran a piecewise regression on this data, and really because I noticed that every time you got water falling below the soil surface, you started to see this uptake in poor water salinity. So it happened here, and we had an abnormally wet year in 2016, so we didn't really see it fall below the soil surface. But, you know, it's up here, poor water salinity is around 11, 12. Surface water salinity is really low compared to that, but you don't see a big reduction. And then in 2017, we got another strong dry down event, and we're starting to see it go back up. And just over the three years that we've been measuring ambient salinity at the site, we've seen an increase from eight parts per thousand to now up to about 13, 14 parts per thousand, just within three years. So we're seeing saltwater intrusion happening at the site at a pretty um, phenomenal rate. So, in conclusion, um, we have, when we expose a freshwater marsh, we think it's first going to be exposed to both salinity and phosphorus, and although that might stimulate productivity and increase above ground biomass, you get this reduction in below ground biomass live roots, and we actually, Sean was able to measure peak collapse happening at the, this, this level of salinity. Um, then, so when you go from 10 to 20 parts per thousand, you really increase the salinity. We start to see a reduction in above ground biomass, uh, even less live roots in the soil, and we measure more peak collapse happening. And then when you add drought, it just doesn't look good. It accelerated peak collapse, and it's really starting to lead to a change in these ecosystems. So in case you couldn't understand that figure, I have it in text as well. So what, what drives peak collapse and what are the mechanisms? at least what we know so far. So salt water is really a big one. It decreases root growth, increases root death, and at certain levels finally begins to decrease sawgrass gross ecosystem production and really shifts the marsh from a net carbon sink to a source. And hydrology can really uh, accelerate this peak collapse elevation loss. So at the beginning I asked what is peak collapse? So we can kind of uh, start to put a definition to it. So we think of it as a relatively rapid shift in the soil carbon balance, leads to a net loss of carbon and soil elevation, and it can culminate in the conversion of a marsh to open water ponds. And we're actually seeing this kind of happening at our brackish water site. Um, so it was, it was pretty remarkable to see these, these pedestals of sawgrass you know, surviving and actually being pretty productive, even though the soil was collapsing around them and their roots were becoming exposed. But you know, at some point they just can't hold their own weight anymore and they fall over. So we see this happening where the sawgrass in the middle of this pond is now dead and going to probably 
lead to making this pond even bigger. So, now that you're all thoroughly depressed and uh, <laughs> have no faith in everything, I've been told my uh, presentations have been ending on a very depressing note. So, I want to end on a more positive note. So, what can be done? Um, so, really, the big one is Everglades restoration. You know, it's been in the works for a really long time, but really, it's, it's important to help for the survival of these marshes. Um, so, getting greater freshwater flow can do two things. It can push back the salt water from coming in, so it can push back the saltwater wedge, keep the marshes fresh, but it can also prevent these periods of dry down from happening that we see and we've measured our accelerating peak collapse. Uh, the second thing is what happens naturally in these marshes. Um, typically, mangroves, you get a transition from uh, coastal marsh to mangroves, especially in South Florida. So these propagules come in, they become established, and you, know, you can get a, a healthy mangrove ecosystem. But one concern we have is that the rate of collapse is happening so quickly, and these ponds are so forming so fast and becoming so deep, that mangroves can't actually become established in these ponding areas. So you, get the, you can get mangroves coming in, but you get the landscape dotted by these open water areas that are not vegetated anymore, and all this carbon stored in the soil can potentially be released. And there's always the crazy scientist idea that I have, which I don't include in any of my papers, and don't quote me in the Miami Herald <laughs> saying this, because I'll deny it, but you know, if, we, if we're seeing this collapse happening so quickly, and mangroves are the only thing that can come in and save them, then why don't we actually <laughs> fly these airplanes in and force mangrove uh, <laughs> migration to come in and these can become established and become nice, healthy mangrove ecosystems. But, you know, that's just the crazy scientist in there. Okay, so I want to say I only really talked about carbon cycling in this talk. There's so much more I wish I could, but yeah, I'm already out of time, but I want to point out that there's a lot more that we study. Um, if you go to Vivi's Defense, which is next Friday, she's going to talk about the algal component and how it's affected by saltwater intrusion. Uh, Shelby, she's defending in May, and she'll tell, talk to you about the microbial component. component. And Sean, who's defending this summer, really goes into the, the, the dirt of it, the litter and roots. So yeah, thanks for coming out. I'll take any questions. talked about, okay, drought, how often does this happen? Yeah. So what kind of, I mean, how many consistent years of hard drought would it take to break this thing? Um, I mean, I, I just recently kind of analyzed this data, and I started going back and saying, like, okay, we're seeing this dry down happen every year. Is it even associated with drought? And what I saw was it, it wasn't really. It didn't matter if there was a drought year or not. Um, sometimes when there was a, no a normally wet year, it wouldn't dry down as much, but it's really, I don't think it's really controlled by drought. It's, it's, uh, there's also, it could be that the way the, the topography of the landscape is, is that just this area drains a lot quicker than maybe some other marshes. So that could be a reason why. Um, but really, I'm, I'm really excited about this uh, the set data that we're gathering because, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see this in a mesocosm setting, but to, you know, build it up to more landscape scale, you need those field measurements. Thank you. Steve. I also have a question about that, um, your, the drought concept and thinking about how that might drive the, the dry down patterns. Um, have you thought about, given sort of the location of the brackish site, have you thought about normalizing um, those water level conditions to the tidal boundary conditions as a way to um, sort of determine the influence of the drought? That was a pretty severe drought that we had. It was, it was rather short, 
in duration, but it was pretty severe. And I was surprised that the water levels did not dip as far down as maybe 2009 um, or 2004, I think that is, uh, which were sort of recognized as drought periods, but um, there's a substantial difference there. And I wonder if the tidal boundary conditions that might sort of raise the soil water levels might be influencing that to some extent. It's, it's possible. Um, I think the, the reason it didn't dry down as much is if you look at you know, the actual data, we got this really big rainstorm in the middle of this drought period. So, you know, maybe during that the 2009 you didn't get this, so this continued to go down. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I haven't really thought about the tidal boundary as much as I thought about maybe during these dry periods, you're getting your, because soil or water level falls below the soil surface, you're allowing groundwater upwelling to occur. And that's why maybe why um, you're getting higher salinities when this dry down occurs. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that from some of Renee Price and Josh Allen, I've talked to them, they have groundwater wells out near Westlake and the salinity is much, much higher in the groundwater. So uh, it could be, it could be the tidal um, influence is able to come in during these dry periods, or it could be, you know, groundwater up Yeah. Jack? I found your, your draft concept interesting. And in contrast to uh, sedge brackish water marshes of southwest Louisiana, we saw collapse have occurred there with the one drought to occur because the seed bank would respond during a drought when one between the clumps, we started getting other vegetation that actually held the marsh together, like mm -hmm. copa and lower sprite brush and a bunch of other things that would come in. Yeah. Uh, so I, it's an interesting contrast. Yeah, in, in this brackish water marsh, uh, it's only sawgrass left, so there's no other vegetation. You know, it's starting to get uh, mangroves and buttonwood to, to come in. But um, So I think here, when you get the trout, because you know those other uh, vegetation like the coat, they can't handle this already high salinity as well. So you're not seeing possibly the establishment of, of new uh, vegetation when the marsh dries down, like you would in Louisiana. Luca. Good job, Ben. Thanks. Uh, what can your work say about the differences between Shark River and Taylor Slip? Well, Let's see, most of my work came from the Shark River Slough side, and those soils are much more peaty than Taylor Slough. And, you know, we've seen from Eddie Fleck's data is when you actually get longer periods of dry down, productivity actually increases in Taylor Slough. So it's, it's kind of the opposite response. They're really hard to compare to each other. Um, so, but also in Taylor Slough, you really start to see the influence of the white zone more in the brackish areas. So, you know, there's, there's different interactions going on that I'm not even fully sure of that could be happening, but it's, it's, it would be interesting to start comparing the, the two sloughs and to see if, you know, we're getting the same responses. So that's a good point. 